this one scripture today uh, as we uh, come to the conclusion of our short uh, series on prayer. It's in James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I want to continue uh, talking to you about prayer and uh, continue to encourage you to give you uh, secrets. Today we're going to talk about a few secrets of prayer. Uh, before I continue on with my sermon, I want to share with you a few uh, illustrations. Uh, a couple of them kind of funny. It reminds me of my own, my own oldest boy when we were in church and, and uh, he was a little fella. And he, uh, Marlene kind of act up. And uh, when I was able to get away from the, from the platform of the podium, uh, Richard, I, I'd pick him up and, and you know, take him back. And, and he would, uh, in a loud voice, say, I'll be good. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll be good, I'll be good. Right? <laughs> this little story kind of reminds me of that. And it goes like this. It's by John McCannon, McMahon. It says, attending church in Kentucky, we watched an, an especially verbal and boisterous child being carried out, slung under his irate father's arm. No one in the congregation so much as raised an eyebrow until the child captured everyone's attention by crying out in a charming southern accent, y'all pray for me now. (laughs) (laughs) This album by J. Keith Johnston says, a tale is told about a small, small town that had historically been dry but when the local businessmen decided to build a tavern, a group of Christians from a local church were concerned and planned an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. It just so happened that shortly thereafter, lightning struck the bar and it burned to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church, claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible. <laughs> but the church hired a lawyer <laughs> to argue in court that they were not responsible. The presiding judge, after his initial review of the case, stated that no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear, the tavern or owner believes in prayer and the Christians do not. (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty interesting. This last one. Early African converts to Christianity were earnest and regular in private devotions. Each one reportedly had a separate spot in the thicket where he would pour out his heart to God. Over time, the paths to these places became well worn. As a result, if one of these believers began to neglect prayer, it was soon apparent to the others they would kindly remind the negligent one, brother, the grass grows on your paths. Amen. So as a reminder, four points that we've been uh, uh, talking about in the past couple of weeks or past few weeks, uh, as we continue on our journey with prayer, Starts out by seeking. Amen. After seeking, what's the next point? Anybody? Yeah. Knowing. Why? And after knowing, it leads us to what's the third point? Loving. loving. And after loving, as we continue on in prayer, it leads us to what? Following. Following. Amen. And then once all four points are concluded, what happens then after that? <laughs> we repeat it, start all over again. That's part, that's prayer. That's, it, it, it conveys all these points that I just mentioned. Seeking leads to knowing God. Knowing leads to loving God. And the more we fall in love with God, the easier it is to follow God. Can someone say amen with me? When we stray away from God and the thinking starts to grow because we don't no longer pray or seek after God, uh, then it becomes more difficult to do what God has called us to do. It becomes more difficult to even follow Him, if you will. And so I'm going to continue to encourage you to pray. If you've not developed a prayer life, I want to encourage you to do so. Amen. It's, it is amazing to, to be connected with God. Now, it doesn't mean that, that God is always going to answer our prayer according to how we believe it should be answered. But God is always at work. God is always listening. He's hearing. Amen. And if he chooses to do so in hearing our prayer, amen to that. Right? If he, for whatever reason, has another plan, amen to, amen to that as well. He knows what he's doing. He is a sovereign God. But we will continue to pray, Richard, and ask God to answer our prayers, no doubt. Amen. That's one, one uh, characteristic of prayer. We, we, we ask God. 
and we pray for others as the other. And so I want to share with you a few points in, in James, right? We, we talked in James concerning uh, that the, the, right, the, the fervent prayer of a righteous person. Fervent means that a person will not stop praying, that a, a person is, is, is believing in that prayer works and that somehow God is listening to that prayer. And that person in their fervency, if you will, they will not back it down from prayer. Thank God for those individuals that will not back down prayer. Amen. I'll, I'll share with you a, a short testimony. My grandmother was a praying woman. Uh, she very well could have been a Methodist. She looked Methodist. She acted Methodist, but she was not Methodist. Uh, Terry, she come to church uh, every every chance she had. She come in with her Bible. She carried her. She believed in carrying her Bible, and she believed in making that fun. You know, you remember that time, right? She walked into church, and she was a prayer machine. I'm telling you, not only in church but outside of church. The reason I know is because the times that I would spend with her, or she'd come spend time with my family. Uh, I would stay awake at night trying to uh, uh, outdo her as she prayed, trying to stay awake, you know. And so I would tell myself as a as a little little boy, I want to beat her. I you know I want to stay awake and she, until she says amen and she stops her prayer or concludes her prayer. And and I'll tell you what, Stephanie, I I stay there awake and I fight to sleep, and pretty soon my eyes are just and after a while I, I was gone. I was asleep. And she continued praying. She prayed and prayed for everyone. She prayed for the president. She prayed for the leaders of our community. She prayed for the pastors and the churches and the family. She, her prayer list was a long prayer list, I'll tell you what. But I thank God for my grandmother's prayer that she chose not to give up on my father. My father, for whatever reason, had strayed away from God and strayed away from the church. And, and uh, he lost his father. My grandfather passed away, and I don't know if that was a what had taken place. And he pretty soon took to drinking and pretty much became an alcoholic. He drank day and night. He drank in the workplace. He drank coming out of the workplace. And it was a constant drinking of alcohol. And it was a constant struggle, even for the family. And I remember my grandmother telling my father, you need to return back to God. And of course, she was one of the only ones that would tell him, you need to repent. You need to give that stuff up and come to God. And, uh, and my father would just kind of shrug it off and say, well, you know, I'll, whenever I get ready, I'll do that. You know, for whatever reason, you know, whatever hurt, whatever brokenness that my father had gone through, it led him down a really dark path. I remember hearing the story, uh, at one point, one preacher, one of my uncles that was a pastor as well, uh, spoke to my father and told him, Mike, you need to seek after God. Change your life. You're headed down the wrong path, and it is a dark path. And my father replied with so much hatred and anger, he said, I'll tell you what, when I get to hell, he said, I'm sure I'll see you and a few other preachers there with you as well. My father was very angry, very broken, very bitter. <coughs> but my grandmother never stopped praying for him. Never stopped praying for him. It was a constant prayer for her family, for her church, for her community. Never stopped praying for him. For him. And the scripture this morning embodies who she was. And if I share with you just a brief testimony as I am of her life, she's gone on to be with the Lord. But she prayed and prayed and prayed, and it was a fervent prayer. It wasn't just one of these prayers that, that you know, she, you pray one minute, and then you forget about it, and you let it go. She continued to pray and pray for her loved ones and the church and, and for the community, the president, and continued praying for my father. Marty and I thank God for that, because one day, my father, you know, uh, we, walked in, we were living in Hopi, Kansas. I remember as a little kid, and we'd gone out to... I can't remember if it was a Pizza Hut or what it was, but my father ordered, you know, a glass of beer, and he was sitting there, sitting there at the table, and he took one sip, and that was the last. Amen. And his testimony was this. He said, when I took that sip, it just hit me the wrong way, and I just disliked alcohol from then on. And from That's one minute to the next, <clears throat> his life, my mother's life, my life, our, my family's life, was changed forevermore. Amen. Because of those prayers, because of those prayers that stand before you this morning, uh, conveying God's word and encouraging God's people, because of those prayers, 
Many people's lives have been changed because of that one prayer for my father and how it affected his life and now my life and then my, my kid's life and hopefully my grandkids' life. It's just amazing. The prayer of a fervent person, a fervent prayer of a righteous person, which means righteousness means standing right with God. Now, it doesn't mean that we're perfect. Doesn't mean that we're standing perfect. Doesn't mean that that we are living in a in a place where things are constantly uh, perfect, if you will. The word perfection, if you understand it in Scripture, when Jesus says, "Be perfect, even if I, as I am perfect," is a, a a translation concerning maturity. So Jesus says, "Be mature, even as I am mature." So it has nothing to do with being perfect. The word perfection means to stand right, to be okay, to understand what maturity is. Righteousness, righteousness means to be standing right with God, which means that every day we don't stand right with God. Can someone say amen with me here? And so therefore every day we need to pray to ask God to help us, right? And to forgive our sins and our faults and our failures so that our prayer then becomes one that is closely connected to God. It's not loose, it's fervent. There is fire behind it. There is, there is conviction behind that prayer, amen. And I want to encourage you, church, this morning, that when you pray, that you pray out of conviction. And I'm going to be sharing a few points with you in just a moment. I want to share this first point. Uh, there are counter prayers which are not always very effective. Can someone say amen? Yes. Uh, we pray sometimes certain prayers that are not as effective as they should be. You know, for whatever reason, they just, it, they're not effective, right? And it could be, we don't, I'm not real sure that I like, can't just hold on to one thing. It could be one Mary that God has definitely his own thing going on. Amen. His will be done. Not our, but his will. Right? And so, Carmen, he may be doing something that we don't understand, and so the prayer is not that effective, but, you know, it's worth asking the question. Now, God, is this your will, or is our prayer not as effective as it should be because maybe we're not in right standing? Someone say amen to me. What are those reasons? Prayer with the wrong motive cannot be effective, number one. So when we pray with the wrong motive, prayer can't be as effective as it should be. Now, prayer is good, don't get me wrong, all the way around. But Marlene, if we're praying with the wrong motive, if, if maybe we're not in the right standing, and someone else is, but then we believe that we're right, that person is wrong, and we start praying for them, does, does that make sense? I'm sounding really confusing here. <laughs> or if we're praying for, uh, you know, something that doesn't really, God, let me win the lottery. <laughs> right? That's a good one right there, right? We went this, obviously don't. <laughs> Don't do that. I'm not really sure if you do it, Don. I'm not going to condemn you and criticize you nonetheless. God loves us all nonetheless. And someone say amen with me. Uh, but, but prayer with the wrong motive is not effective. There's no way it can be effective. It has to be the right motive. It has to be that we're in right standing with God at that moment. God, that 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 your will be done, Father. And whatever your will is, not. I'd like for this to go this way, uh, but God, you will be done. It's a tough one. It is really a tough one. It's tough even, you know, when you talk about, you know, when someone, a loved one is not feeling well or, or we're not doing well, you know, and so our prayer is God, you know, bring healing or God change that person's life. Well, what is it that God really is intending to do and how long is it going to take? I'll tell you what, before my father came to God and he came to the church, it took years before that took place. It took a long time. If my, if my grandmother had, you know, had, had been a person that gave up pretty quickly, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be here today. Father, your will be done. Prayer continues, your will be done. But Father, hear my prayer. Change my son's life. Turn his life around. Father, but your will be done. God, answer my prayer, but your will be done. Amen. And continue firmly there. Now, if we're praying with the wrong motive, obviously, in James chapter 4, verse 3, listen to what James says. James chapter 4, verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motive, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James, James is pretty amazing when you read the book of James. 
And some have even said that, that James, you know, uh, his, James' knees were callous because he was a praying person. Amen. He, he was constantly praying. And when you read the, the letter of James, that comes up. He's always talking about prayer. He's talking about, you know, uh, uh, bringing people who are coming back to God and, and the motive being right and, and making sure that the person is where they need to be in relationship to God. Right? Now, don't get me wrong. I believe God hears all prayers. I believe that if we're not right and something drastic happens, that we, we pray, you know, at that specific moment, God will hear the prayer. I, I, I believe that. But it may be married because our heart falls in place briefly with him. Amen. Take, for instance, that song that uh, uh, Jesus Take the Wheel. All right? Think about that one for a little bit. If you've heard that song, if you carry on with it. Now, who knows where her heart was or the writer's heart was at in the story? Right? And if it was not where it needed to be for whatever reason, it fell into place pretty quick once they lost control of that car. Right? Jesus Take the Wheel. The person's heart briefly, their spirit came in, 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 in right standing with God. The person was extremely sincere. And we see this whenever we, we find ourselves in moments of, uh, of dire straits, moments where we are you know, possibly up against the corner of a wall, something drastic is happening, something drastic has happened suddenly that we, okay, God, please help me, please hear my prayer. And our heart then falls in place what needs to be briefly. But I want to encourage you right, to keep your heart where it needs to be before that happens. There is no need for you and I to wait for something drastic to happen before our heart falls in, falls in place with God. Amen. Let's, let's do that ahead of time. Right. Now listen. Psalm 66, verse 18. If we know that sin lives in our lives, and we know that we're sinful people, but if we know there's a sin there, an intentional sin, prayer cannot be effective. We are creatures of, of habit. Can someone say amen? Yeah. And, and uh, if we can do something to get away with it and not, you know, not let the whole world know about it, we will do that. Our human nature is pretty interesting. It's pretty amazing. In fact, and, and uh, I see some of you smiling. Yeah, you know, if there's something no one, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, it's a proven fact that uh, the, the biggest addictions uh, are online gaming, online uh, gambling, and even online gaming. gaming. Why? Or even uh, uh, online pornography. Why is that so big? Why is it such a big deal online? Because there's no one around that person that is doing that to keep that person from or to tell that person don't do it or watch it. So the person's in their room alone and they're either you know, uh, going after you know, pornography sites or you know, uh, gambling, if you will. There's no one there to tell the person, quit. So the person just feels like, I'm okay now. And the more that, the more that person does that one thing, the easier it becomes to continue to do it. And the person no longer feels conviction or feel bad about doing it. And pretty soon, the individual becomes a person that is consumed by that habit, whatever that habit is. We are creatures of, of habit. And if we can get away with something, we will do something. Be here, be with me. I want to say amen with me. Even church folks. <laughs> right. but we, we develop cultures based, you know, around that idea or that, that behavior sometimes. <coughs> And I'm here to tell you that in Christ Jesus that, that uh, prayer cannot be effective if sin abides in your life and in my life. If we know there is something that is not right and, and, and we know it, you know, you, we can hide it from each other very well, but you can't hide it from yourself and you can't hide it from God. And if you want to be in close relationship to God where he hears your prayer, then, in the name of Christ Jesus, I invite you to let go of that sin, whatever that sin is. Can someone say amen? amen. I'm with you. I'm there with you. Don't, don't, don't feel like you're the only one. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning. Right? 
I'm with you. Our, our human nature is amazing. It's incredible. And we do these things. And the more we do something, you know, that we can hide from everyone else, the, the better it feels sometimes. Think about it. But is it in God's will? Will God hear our prayer? Listen to what Psalms, the psalmist says in chapter 66, verse 18. If I had cherished sin, cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. This is David, the psalmist. If I had held on to sin in my heart, God would not have listened to my prayer. God would not have listened. So folks, I want to encourage you to, to learn to, to, to be in relationship with God and learn to be holy for God. Not because the preacher says it, not because the church, you know, believes it. No, it's got to be a personal thing. It's got to be a personal thing, folks. It cannot be because someone else is doing it or others are doing it or because someone said that this is what we ought to do. It should be because we love God so much that we want to follow him wherever he leads us. And, in, and when we understand what holiness is, does anyone understand what holiness is? Sanctification. Terry, what have we been studying on Fridays? What's sanctification of holiness? The process of being put into right standing with God or to be set apart for God's purpose. To be set apart for God's purpose. Amen. Now, God can use anything and anybody anywhere. Right? In spite of how holy the person may think they are or not. Can someone say amen with me? Amen. God will use anything and everything. But imagine, God, how much more God can use you or me if we understand what holiness is. If we understand that God has placed on this earth for a specific reason and we're set apart temporarily because he's doing something. He's preparing us for something else in the future, for something that he wants us to do. Amen. Now, holiness is being set apart, not indefinitely. Make sure you get that. Right? Because sometimes we, the church, become so holy in the past that we... We're just not going to connect with anybody, no matter how what's going on, because they're not right, or they're not doing what Pam, they're not doing, they're not living right, or not doing this that's right in accordance to how we see things. So we become, you know, holier than thou was the term about a few years back, self-righteous, and God can't use us even there, and He can't really even hear the prayer there. Amen, church. So what is it that God wants us as He separates us in holiness? He's separating us as he's preparing us for something special. Whatever that is, not just in the church, but outside of the church, the life of the church, out, out in the workplace, out with your family, out wherever you're at, away from the four walls of this building. God is calling you and I to continue to live a life that glorifies his name. And the only way to do that is to understand what, what relationship is with God. And this happens through prayer additional point this morning. Or better yet, Psalms continue with that. Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. David understood himself as well. He knew himself well. He says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what, the, what is evil in your sight, so that you're right, so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. David understood himself. He understood his, his nature. If there's anyone that you and I can relate to concerning uh, those negatives with human nature, David is one that we can relate to. He, he messed up things pretty royally at time too. Can someone say amen with me? Amen. He messed things up at time or two pretty royally. So we can understand David. David understands human nature. An unforgiving spirit will hinder prayer. This is a big one. Can someone say amen with me? Mark chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's pretty powerful, church, if you think about it. If you can't forgive someone else, God cannot forgive you. Therefore, our prayer cannot really be heard from God. It won't be effective, in other words. So I don't know if, if, 
if you harbor things in your heart, I don't know what your life is, and you don't have to you don't have to share it with me or anyone else. But I do know that in this journey we call life, we go through some pretty heavy things, and there's been some things that have been done against each one of each and every one of us in this place. It's one same memory. And we hold on to those offenses sometimes. And pretty much they become part of who we are. And it dictates every single step that we take in life afterwards. <coughs> St. Matthew, I'm here in the name of Christ Jesus to invite you to let go of that offense, to continue on in, in deeper relationship, greater relationship with God through prayer. If you don't let go of that offense, if you can't forgive, Someone else, God cannot forgive you. That's real simple in scripture. What is it that God wants? For you and I, he wants us to come to a place, Richard, where we are set free. Free to what? Free to live for Jesus. Free to, to show the world who Christ is through our actions and all that we do. I know we do a lot of good things here at St. Matthew. Don't get me wrong. I know that there's a lot of prayer going on. I know I'm speaking to a, a, a mature group of folks. I know that, but I also understand our human nature and, and how the enemy uses that at times against us so that we are not able to live as God has called us to live for his glory. A few points that I want to share with you as I conclude my sermon this morning. Let your prayer be your first choice, not your last. Amen. Let your prayer be your first choice, not your last. Another one. Let your gaze be on God and your glance on your request. Not the other way around. That's a good one, right? Let your gaze be on God and your prayer and your glance on your request. Pray more from conviction than from crisis. <coughs> Pray more from conviction in crisis. Don't, don't wait for, the, for that moment of crisis to really pray. And God will hear. I believe God can answer as well. I mean, he's, he's God. He can do what he wants, what he wants, how he wants to. And who can argue with that? Pray from conviction, not from crisis. Pray in the spirit and by the spirit. We'll have to come back and revisit this some of these. I mean, this is a good Bible study points. Pray in the Spirit and by the Spirit. And whose Spirit? God's Spirit. And by His Spirit. You may be asking, how do you do that? How do you do that? It's a good question. We'll have to come back. Give me a call. We'll sit down and we'll help Bible study if you will. Let your prayer be filled with praise. Amen to that one. Let your prayer be filled with praise. <coughs> Start your prayer off with praise, giving God honor and glory and praise and adoration and lift him up. You know, Father of the universe, we give you thanks. Amen. I love the prayer does that, right? Uh, let your prayer be filled with praise. Not just not just our request, but let it be filled with praise. God, I give you honor and glory and praise. When you read the scriptures and and, and the prophets of old and and all those great, you know, individuals in the Bible that spoke to God, uh, it, it's a constant, uh, uh, really, that you, it seems like they, 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 they're buttering God up, if you will. <laughs> it, it's a constant, God, you know, creator of heaven and earth, Father, Lord of all, and they, you know, they're just Jehovah, they're just, they lift God up in a high place, and then the request comes afterwards. Right? And for a few years ago, a few years ago, I kind of giggled with that one, Sometimes you're trying to butter God up, right? No, no. Give him God the glory, his praise, and his honor. 